Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Mark Walsh. Okay, on the show today, Petri Bernston. So he is a philosopher of breathing. Have I got that right, sir? Yes, you have got that extremely well. Philosopher of breathing, that's how I would describe myself. So cool, so cool. Okay, and where are you in the world? I'm in Finland at the moment, and uh, there's a small place called Hapavesi. I I live in Helsinki, but now I have been staying 500 kilometers north of uh, Helsinki, enjoying the summer here in Hapavesi. Well, I, I like Finland very much. I taught there once by a frozen lake in the middle of winter, and it was wonderful. I have a, a Finnish student who I'm very fond of, and she's remarkably weird in a very lovely way, and she tells me that's typical. So um, uh, I'm looking forward to this, Petri. Well, when you said you, you were next to a lake, I am now staying one minute walk away from the lake. I have just sp- today swam two times already. Jumping in the lake. Okay, good, good, yeah. good. Uh, okay, how did you get interested in the breath, Petri? How did that happen? Well, uh, many, many years ago when I was thinking in philosophy, I was studying theoretical philosophy in University of Helsinki, and I was thinking what will be my master thesis theme. And I, I was doing, uh, I was practicing a lot of singing, and I was thinking that it's possible to make a philosophical thesis, your master thesis on singing, and then I was talking with uh, my a, a philosopher, very important to me, a phenomenologist, Juha Varto. And uh, I asked him, like, what, 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 what does he think about if I would do a phenomenological study of singing? And he said that it's a pretty cool idea, but breathing could be even more interesting because it's connected to singing, but it is connected so much to more. And it's kind of like the the ground of our being, if we could see it. So there it started. Then I did my master thesis on breathing. And in the final uh, moments of my master thesis, I started to understand that I have have some insights that I have never seen anybody, at least in the written form anywhere, uh, put in books or articles. They didn't come to my uh, master thesis, but that gave me the idea of uh, I need to do a PhD on this and then that started the whole journey of doing a PhD, and then I, uh, my dissertation was uh, finalized in 2018. And uh, so that's one of the first uh, philosophical dissertation, PhD dissertations on breathing, and actually the first one on phenomenological ontology. Okay, I, I know those word means, but we'll break those down as much as anyone does. For listeners in a little bit, we'll come back to phenomenology, phenomenology and ontology. So um, this is actually really interesting. On the one hand, our whole language is full of, um, in, in many languages, you know, the breath of life or God breathe life into, you know, Adam or the soil or whatever. This idea that breath is really central to who we are and mm-hmm. it's central to almost every embodiment practice. There are a few that's not, but most would say, you know, yoga, martial arts, dance, so many of them would say the breath is the center of the practice. And breath work has become very popular in modern times. Um, And yet, in philosophy, I've almost never heard it mentioned. Um, You know, in more academic, more kind of literate kind of circles. A little bit on the body, you know, a little bit on experience, but almost nothing on the breath. So how has this happened that our intellectual class has somehow missed the thing that's most essential for our survival, most primary to our being, and has been part of spiritual and and psychological practice through thousands of years. How has that happened that you're one of the first to do this? That, That is madness. It is very, very strange and also very interesting. Uh, what, how would, uh, one, how would one kind of come in terms with this very weird situation? Uh, I would say that there are quite few uh, reasons for this. First of all, uh, already in ancient philosophy, in ancient Greek, Greece, the, the words that meant breath, especially psuche, 
which means originally breath, uh, and then only uh, in the secondary sense, in the, in the etymological sense, it means breath. And then it started to mean soul or mind or spirit or this kind of stuff. And this happened already in uh, Plato's works. He interpreted uh, the suhe uh, in the first sense in the rational manner and something connected to our thinking and to the theory of the theory of the ideas and stuff like this. Uh, because before Plato, uh, the, the, some of the Greek pre-Socratic philosophers, they were thinking of the breath. For example, Anaximenes, who saw that the breath, he connected breath with the soul and with air. So there is these kind of roots, but it, it got completely forgotten through so many different reasons. And uh, one of the reasons, and uh, I have not myself studied so deeply this question of what's the history of this forgetting of breathing in Western philosophy. Uh, but Plato, uh, how, he, how after Plato and through Plato, the, the psuche, which originally meant breath, was forgotten and it got this kind of rational meaning and meaning which meant thinking. And uh, then I would say also in the Cartesian philosophy, Descartes, when he split human being in half to, uh, to the body as a substance and a soul as sub, uh, another substance, and then breath was understood to be part of the body, which would mean then that it is some kind of, which then through the sciences and through this kind of mechanistic worldview, it was started to understand that breath is some kind of a, a materialistic, mechanistic process of only like a physiological survival, which doesn't have any kind of connection to uh, human thinking or human experience or philosophical life or wisdom and so on. So how this, this question that you made yeah. to me is actually so yeah, deep. Yeah, yeah. And it's big, isn't it? And if I may interrupt a little bit here, there's a, it strikes me that it was very inconvenient for someone like Descartes, I think always gets slightly a bad name in embodiment circles, somewhat unfairly, I would say, but mm -hmm. it's very inconvenient if we say, you know, breath is the, joining point of body and mind is the interface of body and mind it's how mm -hmm. one impacts one from the other now that's a little bit inconvenient to someone who's splitting those two worlds apart that there's this thing that's very obviously a bridge in the you know if you're stressed your breath changes and you can change your breath be less stressed right let's just use that as an example mm -hmm. is that body is it mind well it's both clearly so I, I can see where that might have been a bit taken out of the picture as sort of not really one or the other Mm -hmm. And Descartes has in his uh, metaphysical uh, papers on first philosophy, his uh, book where he has this very um, important description where he says that how he can withdraw himself into the, the thinking self or the, the thinking thing to his consciousness or to his soul is that he withdraws from all senses. And he says that he closes his eyes and he uh, puts uh, something in his ears yeah, that yeah, he doesn't. Yeah. And then he uh, withdraws after that from all the other senses. And in our book, uh, also in 2018, came out the first uh, anthology on philosophy of breathing, which I edited with the Slovenian philosopher Leonard Skoff, who is another yeah. philosopher of breathing. So in our introduction uh, to this book, we were taking this uh, Descartes' uh, description, and then we were saying and writing that uh, Descartes, when he says that he withdraws from all senses, and that's how he becomes familiar with his inner self, which is the soul, which is somehow immaterial and... Uh, withdrawn from the, the physical world that this is some kind of like the culmination point of like how Western philosophy truly start to think that the body is not uh, something that is a source of wisdom. Uh, and then what, what we say in this introduction is that actually uh, Descartes is making a totally fictitious uh, description because when he says that he withdraws from all the senses, that means that he also closes his nose, that he doesn't uh, smell anything, and he closes his mouth, that he doesn't taste anything. 
And then through this kind of process, he says that he'll er, find some kind of real inner self or some kind of immaterial soul. But if he would, and then he starts to think uh, rational ideas and questions of philosophy, but if he would have been truly truthful in his description, the first thing that would have happened would have been total panic and anxiousness and dreadful uh, experience of, I can't breathe, I, I need air. Uh, and then if he would have taken truthfully this, what he said he was going to do in our philosophical tradition uh, in the modern philosophy would be totally different. Right, right. If they, yeah, and it does seem to me that Western philosophy is often very weak on praxis. It's often very weak on, on having a, a yoga right in terms of some sort of practical sense of how you know what do you do about it how does it work you know what's the system of transformation which is where the eastern sort of things seem to come come in strongly um That's true. so you mentioned um a phenomenology so kind of philosophy of experience primary of experience mm -hmm. and ontology which if i remember rightly philosophy of being right Yes. Okay. So these are sort of two orientating positions or schools for you in this work. Yes. Like I in my in my PhD, which I call the the, the title of the PhD is phenomenological ontology of breathing. So I'm doing phenomenological ontology, and uh, first of all, phenomenology means, as you said, it's a return to phenomena as it appears to us in our experience. So it's always a return to our experiential uh, life world, how we experience the world. And then especially in my uh, PhD, I take the patron sa saint of uh, philosophy of body, the French philosopher, Maurice Merleau-Ponty's work. And I take his small, he's, he's famous for his phenomenology of perception and his phenomenology of the body. He, He's, he has scattered like hints of what breathing could be, mean in, in uh, phenomenology. And I take this in my PhD and then I, I start to think what these descriptions of the breath could mean if they would be start taken as a starting point of philosophical thinking. So first of all, what I do is I put aside or put out of play all scientific knowledge of the breath. Because that's the only way you can get to phenomenology, because uh, what natural sciences, for example, say of the breath is something that we don't experience, because the natural sciences say that the breath is in the first place gas exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen, and that the, it's the cells that need the oxygen, and it's the in our brainstem, the, the respiratory center that is in control of this breathing process and all this stuff. Oh. But in our experience, we experience none of that. We have never experienced cells. We have never experienced carbon dioxide or uh, oxygen or uh, our brains or the brainstem or a respiratory center there in the brainstem. So all this knowledge, which we normally take for granted in phenomenological study, you put aside. And then you start to only wonder what we have through our experience, in our experience. And that is the starting point of my, uh, my uh, philosophy. And then when it's the ontological work on breath, then I start to ask the questions connecting to the being of breathing, the existence of breathing, how our being is in the first place, being in the world, and what does, me, what does it mean that it's the experiential body's relation with the world that is like the ground of our being and how the breath is the first connection there? That kind of stuff. That kind of stuff, you know, just casually at the end there, that kind of stuff, the phenomenal ontology of being, that kind of stuff. Okay, so if this is going over people's heads and it's going over mine a little bit already, what, what have you discovered? What might be interesting for people here? Uh, well, what, what I have discovered is, in a certain sense, I have discovered uh, a new way to do philosophy, to, that we should start to philosophize, to think the deep fundamental questions of life within atmosphere of experiential breathing. Uh -huh. And it's like, in my view, it's like a possibility of 
attaining a certain kind of a respiratory revolution in our lives. So that everything that we have thought in different manners in philosophy and in sciences and in religion and so on, in our culture and different cultures, is that everything actually, all our questions, important questions of our life could be re-examined, rethought and re-experienced within the experience of breathing. And of course, in some of the Eastern traditions, as you mentioned, the breath has been important. But I would say that even they have not thought like questions of, uh, or, or maybe they have, but because the, all the vocabulary needs to be translated into our Western languages. And also th there is so much uh, like layers in the Eastern thought of like, let's say the word Atman, uh, which is so important word in uh, Hindu philosophy and in Upanishads and in uh, other Indian philosophical systems. And it is even for the, the, uh, for the Indian uh, tradition, it has been forgotten quite much that if we think of what Atman means, they say it's uh, the, the inner soul or the, uh, the, the fundamental principle of life or the immortal soul or the, the great spirit or whatever. But it is very often re forgotten that Atman actually means in the first place breathing. Okay, so I mean, can you give an example of this philosophy of breath, this philosophical breathing philosophy combination? Um, give us an example about the uh, about what that looks like. Well, um, well, the first of all, I would say that what what it looks like is that whatever question we are thinking, whatever philosophical question, we need to bring it back to our experience of breath. So. For example, if we start to think ethical questions, the questions of like, what is a good life? Yep. Then this, uh, we bring it to the question, if, if the breath is the certain kind of root or the source of our being and our way of being in the world and our relation to the atmosphere of air. So what would that mean if we start to think the questions of good life? So that would mean that we would, in the first place, would start to need to think, what does it mean that as a breathing beings who are all the time connected with this atmosphere, this invisible atmosphere through our breath, how we would connect the ethical questions, for example, the question of good life, into this kind of, uh, how would I say, into this kind of field of respiratory thinking. So then... Uh, it, it means this, that whatever we are thinking, we need to bring it back to questions of breath and start to think what it would mean if we take seriously that we are in the first place breathing beings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is your philosophical breath work. Uh, yes. I'm fascinated by embodied ethics as an idea. I studied ethics a little bit at, at the university as a sideline, just as I was doing psychology, but I, of all the sort of philosophical um, the areas of philosophy, ethics, and, you know, what, what is the good life? What do we value? Or what should I fucking do when I get up in the morning? You know, like, like that mm -hmm. always struck me as the most practical form of philosophy in many ways. It's like, okay, well, what's good? You know, what has value? And it's very interesting. I was doing a lot of martial arts at the time, and it was never, you know, mm -hmm. it was, they felt like I was doing this physical thing, and then, you know, the seriously connect with ethics and noticing in my body that I'd have ethical responses to things. You know, some things would take my breath away. Some things would, you know, tighten my breath. Some things would smoothen my breath when I did good things in a certain way. And, and yet that was just never talked about in any of the philosophy books I was reading. There was just mm -hmm. zero on the body. Yet, yet it was very, ethics was very obviously a bodily experience for me. Mm -hmm. Some things opened my heart. Some things made me contract, you know? And uh, I, did, did, I saw almost nothing in the philosophy books that I read about the, about the body. Well, for example, when, you, uh, when I, I said the ethics and you said that it's uh, the question of the body and connected with breathing, the ethical questions, one of the things that I have written about and I gave also a presentation in Slovenia a few years ago, uh, the, it, there was a hospitality conference, the hospitality of uh, ethical hospitality or hospitality of ethics. I gave a talk where, and then it later was published in one book about uh, anthology on hospitality. And my, 
article and my presentation was about the uh, respiratory and aerial hospitality. So the first, we have this idea that we uh, welcome somebody with open arms into our house, and then this is as a form of hospitality. So the respiratory hospitality would mean that actually, if we would become conscious of it or aware, we are all the time welcoming with open lungs this invisible atmosphere of air, even if we wouldn't want to do it, but then we could do kind of a practice of it and make it consciously that when that invisible air that I don't know for certain what it is about, but I have to take it in me, it might have... Uh, it might have it's a profound beautiful... trust in a way, isn't it? An act yes. of, to breathe it's is an act of profound trust. And also it strikes me as profoundly intimate that normally you know to take something into your body if you were to do that with a penis or you know some other bodily part that's a tremendously yeah. intimate thing if someone put their tongue in your mouth or yeah. whatever but we're literally taking something into us this very intimate thing that's and the other thing that always strikes me as very interesting is sort of self and other with breath that it's mm -hmm. like we have this is well, i'm here and the world's there but i have to keep taking in this thing from outside of the world um, into myself, you know, and then it becomes me. And equally, mm -hmm. I'm continuously giving out. So there's a, a sense of trust in and kind of generosity out. You know, there's a, a, a way in which it also connects us to every single person, right? Like we're all breathing the same air. Like me yeah. and you are in different countries right now. Mm -hmm. But if I breathe out, that air is going into the same air that you're breathing. Yes. So, sense, exactly. so there's this way, this is connecting quality to air, which I think doesn't exist like i can't touch you from another country but i'm literally breathing into the air that you're breathing into and out of on a on a on a moment by moment basis yeah this is extremely important point that you're making here and this is the how in a in a certain kind of mysterious connection we are all the time with other people that air that was inside of you is now inside of somebody else and there's a dog that is uh, perhaps breathing that <laughs> And then you take that person's, and then there might be some smelling drunkard whose uh, breath you are taking next in. And then there is the person that you hate might be in the same place, or somebody else that you, is just looking some that you would never want to talk or even touch that person who has, for example, politically disgusting ideas in, in, from your point of view, or whatever that might be. Still you are in a much, much more intimate connection with these people <laughs> and these all other yeah. breathing beings. So it is a question of trust and there comes a certain kind of way of which then comes to connection to this idea of hospitality that could we learn totally different kind of way of opening ourselves to others who might think very differently than our us or might have nothing in common with us. So that also is one aspect of that uh, Eth ethical dimension of breathing. Then you mentioned trust, and trust is connected with uh, also you could think of in a certain way religious questions. So that would, if we would take that idea of respiratory trust, there I would suggest when I say that all things could be rethought from the perspective of breathing, then we could start to think totally new way of thinking religion from as a kind of a respiratory religion. Yeah, yeah, when well, it's always been this. Uh, connection of spirituality, like spirit as breath, breath as spirit, hasn't it? Yes, yes. And I'll come back to religion, that feels like a thing to move towards. What about in a sort of COVID, post-COVID environment that, uh, you know, people are being asked to cover their mouths, to not breathe on each other. Um, mm -hmm. I had a very interesting thing yesterday where I tried to talk to a stranger and they almost jumped back, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, because I, I must have been, I was two or three meters away. I was quite far away, but they really jumped mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. And it was like, don't breathe on me. That's mm -hmm. deadly. You know, like this, this idea of the breath has become a weapon now. You know, you can, uh, I heard in England, you can, if you, if you think you have COVID and you cough on someone, you can be accused of attempted murder. <laughs> it, really? Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's, so if you if you if you if you think you have a COVID diagnosis and you're deliberately coughing on people, that is attempted murder. Very interesting. Now I don't know if yes, it's legally it going to stand up, but I made a joke about this. I said, "Oh, I'm just going to go around licking everyone." They're like, "Okay, you could actually be put in prison for that." 
So it's, um, what about this idea that breath has become dangerous in the modern age? Yes, well, of course, uh, this has been, uh, in a certain way, atmosphere has been, uh, uh, you can think atmosphere, like this kind of atmospheric terrorism or atmo-terrorism, where you use already, uh, it's not only in the first place the breath, but how whatever takes place in this invisible atmosphere of air where we don't see what kind of particles are moving there. As I was coming into that, that uh, when there is this, that you need to breathe the air and you are kind of like your life depends on it. And then you don't know what this kind of unfamiliar breath is that same time is keeping you alive. And this was, of course, used, for example, when they were using poison gases in the First World War. Uh, as a, this kind of atmospheric terrorism or uh, German philosopher Peter Sloterdijk has written about this. He calls it atmo-terrorism. And uh, how to then... Sloterdijk is his name? What a great name for someone studying uh, death in the trenches. Sloterdijk. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, and then you, how also the, in the, the Second World War in the, in the concentration camps, the the gassing of the juice was taking place. That was also taking place through the breath. So there is a long history kind of, or there is a history of this kind of uh, breath as a weapon or the, the atmosphere as a weapon. We tend to think of breath in terms of the best things. Like it took my breath away. That woman was so big, yeah. it took my breath away. But equally the idea of strangling someone, gassing someone, I mean, these are some of the most repulsive things as well. So it mm -hmm. seems to exist on us, if we talk aesthetics now rather than ethics as well, it seems to exist on an aesthetic spectrum from the most horrific, ugly things human beings can do. Uh, you know, on the moral end as well as the aesthetic end, but also to the, we talk about it in regards to the most beautiful things, you know, like mm -hmm. you wouldn't share breath with someone deliberately unless you really liked them, you know, uh -huh. like breathing out of each other's eyes, like, like CPR, bit gross, you know, old person falls down in the street of a heart attack, do you really want to do mouth to mouth? I mean, you will, mm -hmm. I hope, out of duty, mm -hmm. but you, you're not going to enjoy it, right? So it's like this, it has this kind of a very aesthetic range you know what i mean from the very mm -hmm. ugly to the very beautiful yes and uh that brings to my mind uh, what some of the early christians were doing uh when you said the breath is spirit and spirit is breath this idea they had this kind of uh, practice or this kind of like connection that they called conspiratio so originally the word conspiracy conspiration means like in a certain way could say respiration is always conspiration because conspiration or conspiracy doesn't mean what we nowadays talk about conspiracy theories and stuff like this but it meant breathing together because that the con Maori, means, Maori greeting where you take a breath together that's uh, yes so noises, yeah. exactly so there was a, a, there is an interpretation or there is a theory that the early christians when, for example, in the Gospel of John, it is said that Jesus breathed the Holy Spirit uh, to the uh, disciples, that there was actually this practice that connected uh, in the most deep sense uh, all the followers of uh, Jesus together was that they were a blowing breath into their, each other's mouth as the uh, practice of sharing the Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit, the, the Greek word is pneuma, which means uh, at the same time spirit and breath. Yes, 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 yes. And a few other languages too, you you see that connection in, in in Hebrew. I think it might be as well. And um, that's very interesting. So there's almost a lineage transmission, isn't there? It's like you're being breathed on by someone who was breathed on by Jesus or something. You know, exactly. This, this exactly. kind of piece is a transmission piece there. Yeah. So, but then, when, but then when the the Black Death came, uh, then people that went out of fashion. The greatest idea. <laughs> that went out of fashion. Those guys died off pretty quick. So I actually, yeah. I mean, breaking so that, aside, I then didn't forget it. that the Christianity forget that the whole we thing. We can't go rid of that one. I worry about a world where we're scared of breath. It disturbed me. Something about this young woman who stepped back yesterday away from me, where I thought, I worry that that's becoming a norm now. That mm -hmm. it's, you know, in the same way as like, uh, 
I, you know, I wouldn't call the, what, what happened in the trenches terrorism. I just call that war, you know, breath war. But I mean, mm -hmm. now it's almost like, okay, is this a, without going to conspiracy theory kind of, you know, conspiracy will bring that in again. But um, it seems to me this this is this, this making us afraid of each other's breath is a very primary thing, whether it's justified or not. That's a very mm -hmm. primary thing to install mm -hmm. in, a, in a global populace global population I, I was on a plane recently and for the first time in ages and people were like scared to breathe because they didn't want to breathe but you can't not breathe right mm -hmm. it's like you could not yeah. touch you could not eat for a little bit you could not drink the water for a few days but you can't not breathe yeah i mean uh, if this uh, goes on this kind of uh, afraidness of and the fear of breath because of covid or something else it's gonna totally transform the, our way of being and i really hope that it's not going toward that kind of direction yeah yeah, yeah there's a dehumanizing quality a disconnecting quality as well in that in that mm -hmm. yeah okay you sort of touched upon spirituality earlier and we've come to this sort of words that have similar meanings and you know the breath of life and this uh, what's your your definition of spirituality in regard to breath then well, I take very literally and very seriously this idea that uh, spirituality and the word spirit, the, la the, the first of the, the, the Greek word pneuma, uh, for example, in the Bible, that it was translated in all the Bibles as spirit, I think that's a huge problem. And uh, I, I would suggest that all Bibles should be retranslated mostly. And every time they, in the New Testament, especially in the Gospels, where Jesus is speaking, I, I would say that the, the, the word pneuma should be translated as breath. And then that was translated to the Latin uh, Bible Vulgate, uh, where still there was the word pneuma was translated to spiritus. And that word spiritus, of course, then meant breath and it meant spirit, how we then understand it now. And that came from the word Latin verb spirare, which means to breathe. So all the spiritual practices and what is called a spirituality, when we talk about spiritual practices, for example, you mentioned before we started to uh, record this, that you have practiced Aikido. And Aikido, of course, has been understood as a spiritual practice in a certain way. And I, in Aikido, for example, the breath is extremely important. And the word key there as a, uh, can be understood as, as breath in a certain sense. So the thing I would say that my understanding of spirituality is that whatever, everything can become a spiritual practice if that practice where there is certain kind of movement or certain kind of way of doing things is always following the breath. Because normally what we do, our breath is following, for example, in athletics, the, the, the runner or the, like the running makes it and then the breath becomes panting and becomes faster and so on. So in a spiritual practice, whatever you are doing, it is the breath that you are listening all the time and all the movements are following and in accordance with the breath. And that would then make a certain practice or exercise spiritual, in my view, if the word spiritual practice is really taken seriously in its original meaning. Wonderful. I just, I'm just sort of working my way through sort of, you know, Holy Spirit and things like this, you know, lots of translations and things. So, um, yeah, I mean, people often ask me what I what I would regard as an embodiment practice, and I say, well, you know, is there body awareness and is there breath? You know, often they're the things that I point to just immediately. It's mm -hmm. uh, kind of as requirements. Okay, um, what do you think most people are missing about the breath in not thinking about it philosophically, not going as deeply into it as you have? I mean, what are some of the, what are some of the sort of things that you think people are missing? that are to you maybe now obvious? Well, uh, they are missing that breath is connected to everything we do. We are normally connected to some of the things that we do. For example, if we do yoga or Aikido or some other uh, spiritual practices or martial arts or stuff like this. But I would say that there is actually a respiratory meaning in everything that we do, even for those things that we never connect with, with the breath. Because how, how I, 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 I claim this, or how I try to argue this, is that 
if you hold your nose and you hold your breath and you start to hold it and you try to do anything that you do in your normal life, whatever that is, and you try to do it by holding your breath and see what happens, how right. fast it becomes totally meaningless what you are actually doing because the only thing you're thinking is how how I could breathe again. I'm starting to feel really dreadful and uh, anxious and so on. So uh, that means that there is some kind of secret respiratory meaning in everything that we do, even if we don't connect it ever with the breath. And that's kind of part of my philosophy of breathing is to start to think what could be those secret meanings. Yeah, I would say that about the body more generally. People sometimes say to me, well, how's the body involved? And I'm like, well, if you do this with your body, it's going to change it. If you, you can mm-hmm. optimize your thinking, your, you know, your, you know, your uh, social interaction, your expression, it's involved with everything you do. You know, wherever you go, your body's there. It's impacting mm-hmm. things. It's just, just a matter of do you know if it's happening? Can you control it? Can you influence it? Or is it happening to you? without you knowing it you know i'm i'm wondering what you know what the breath pattern was like of every single philosopher you know i'm imagining nietzsche you know having this like crazy ragged breath pattern or you know i'm imagining sort of socrates having a, you know having his kind of long out breath kind of easy going or whatever like it would be kind of a fun thing to sort of imagine the uh, breath patterns all these different thinkers who thought that their thinking was independent of their bodies I, I, I think that would be absolutely fascinating. And nowadays, it would be also important to a little bit be following what kind of breathing patterns these current philosophers have. And, and to start to think that could we see perhaps something why they emphasize certain questions because of their breath. And nice. uh, we want to be that way as well, right? Like if, if your philosophy is embodied in manner X, do I want to take on your philosophy by the fruits of it that are being shown in your breath? Sometimes maybe not, you know, sometimes I kind of see people and go, wow, that's your embodiment. Whatever you're thinking, I don't want it in my head. You know, like, exactly. like there's, there's a sign that's being given to me of like, maybe keep away from this guy, you know, mm-hmm. before I hear one word of their philosophy. That's uh, ex- exactly, Mark. Uh, so, so the thing is like what, what uh, in this anthology that we wrote uh, called Atmospheres of Breathing, uh, one of the, uh, the, the key points in our introduction is that we take the Nobel Prize winner of literature, Elias Canetti's, this aphorism, very seriously and start to think what it means because he says that it is not enough to think one also has to breathe. And then comes the important uh, sentence. Dangerous are the thinkers who have not breathed enough. (laughs) Ain't that the truth? Ain't that the truth? Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a sign for me if uh, if people, and I'm not expecting people to be athletic, for example, Mm -hmm. but I want to see a a vibrancy. I want to hear a kindness in their breath, you know? Mm -hmm. Not like Darth Vader breathing, you know, this kind of thing. It's like, Mm, as soon as you hear Darth Vader, you know he's a bad guy from the breath, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, come on, pay attention. This is obvious. Um, well, yeah, and then, when, when you said this, like, for example, if everybody starts to walk in this kind of COVID masks all the time, will it start to make us a little bit like Darth Vader as all? Well? That's a kind of a question which I think is uh, worth of thinking. Worth thinking about, for sure. Worth thinking about it. I'm imagining this really blows the minds of philosophy students. If you were doing a lecture at a university, and you're like, okay, how does Heidegger breathe? No one fucking knows, of course, because no one yeah. understands Heidegger. But it's, it's like, like, that must blow the minds of academics to be even given that question. You know what I mean? Like, that's just not a question that was ever proposed to me in the philosophy department. Uh, well, university, I was like, well, this has been, for many uh, of my colleagues, quite a very strange thing that what I'm doing this philosophy of breathing and jokingly one of my colleagues asked me once when we were having a dinner, he asked, why are you doing this thing? Why you could also doing a philosophy of farting. Wow. So, wow. So, so, so even if that's a joke, normally jokes tell something truth in them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that this, that you can't like make, uh, okay, both this kind of passing gas in a, in a certain way, another from the mouth and some from the other from behind. But the thing is like that, okay, uh, there is a huge difference between farting and uh, breathing. 
it's a way of belittling the body. You know, I had a friend of mine who was actually an anthropologist at the university and he just said, look, my body just carries my head from one lecture to the next, you know? And this was a guy who had like physical health problems by the age of 30. Mm -hmm. I was like, dude, maybe there's a reason why you're having physical health problems. You're only 30 years old and you're having all these health conditions and it's like, you just view your body as, as this sort of brain taxi servant of yours. It just like, come on, dude. Like, and he'd been really bought into the whole academic model and mm -hmm. uh, his health was really suffering as far as I could see. Okay, well, we've covered most things here. I'm just looking for the questions you sent me. There's one uh, neologism here, mind funfulness. What is mind funfulness? You sent me that, I was curious. Yes, I did. And I, I, I'm happy that you asked me from it because that will also, I'm now doing my, uh, I have a YouTube channel which is called Mind Funfulness, and I will soon have a web page which will be called mindfunfulness.com and so on. So what is Mind Funfulness? Mind Funfulness is my, I'm putting together, of course, two words, mindfulness and fun. And of course, nowadays, so many people are talking about mindfulness practices and uh, connected with uh, certain kind of meditative practices as mindfulness and so on. And most of the mindfulness practices start with certain kind of connection with the breath. We start to become mindful of breathing. But, and then people are thinking that they are doing something spiritual. And when they are doing something spiritual, they start to think that they are doing something serious. And for me, true spirituality is always something to do with fun, something to do with playfulness. That if you are truly spiritual and you are, your breath is alive, your body is alive, there is always something playful and fun in your whole way of existing. And so this is my uh, kind of uh, putting together these two words, fun and mindfulness, and starting to think that how you could, because I've been practicing mindfulness meditation for many years, mm. but then I connected with laughing with it, for example, that you go into mindfulness breathing and you just let the breath, you follow the breath, and then suddenly you burst into laughter while you are still doing the meditation. <laughs> and you laugh for some minutes, then you go back to your mindfulness meditation. And then you start to laugh again and you go back to your mindfulness meditation. And how you could start to think that this starts to, they become intertwined the laughing and the mindfulness meditation? And is it possible that this awareness that you are uh, being aware of your breath, this consciousness, could it be that the quality of that consciousness, the quality of that awareness would start to change? It would start to become certain kind of laughing uh, awareness. And then you wouldn't be anymore being aware of the breath and following the breath in this kind of serious awareness but it would become kind of a playful act of like that your conscious would be totally different when it is following the breath and it's in accordance with the breath when you are doing the, the laughing with it. And the laughing itself is, of course, one way of breathing. It's one of the greatest... Uh, breathing pattern. It's an interesting to, breathing pattern. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. one of the greatest ways to practice your diaphragm is laughing. Yeah, releasing the diaphragm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, all of a sudden, the breathing patterns of eroticism and laughter, the, you know, grief, you know, these things all have quite specific breathing patterns that are not nothing. And okay. also, like, if I can still continue a few things, uh, it is important to remember, of course, the, uh, the mindfulness practices of mindfulness of breathing comes from the Buddhist tradition. And in the Chinese and uh, Japanese Zen tradition, there has always been these monks who have been laughing Buddhas. There are stories of these monks who come to the marketplace and the only thing they start to do is laugh. And they are laughing yeah, and yeah, laughing. People me. gather around them and everybody's laughing together. And this is kind of a spiritual practice. And then we, your mind yeah, will... Yeah. Yeah. And, and then I want to say another thing, which I, because I'm so much fascinated by stand-up comedy. Uh, me too. So, go on. Go on. And... I love uh, the greatest comedians. I think they are truly deep thinkers as well. And so the, the whole, whole idea of deep thinking and insightful thinking needs always jokes. It needs always laughing. For example, if you take uh, stand-up comedy of George Carlin or 
Bill Hicks or Doug Stanhope or my, oh, uh, my great, hero. Great. I have some jokes about Finnish people. So there's two Finnish guys standing in a bar. They've been there for an hour in complete silence. One says to the other, after an hour, eventually they've had three beers. He looks at him and says, how are you doing? And his friend turns back to him and said, do we come here to drink or to talk? Yes, this is, this. all the Finns tell this to all the foreigners. <laughs> I have heard this like maybe a million times. But I'm sorry, I'm, but it's cliches, but uh, there's a, there's, there is a glint and twinkle in the eye of Finns. It's a little bit different than Scandinavians that you often get confused with. There's definitely something... Uh, as a, 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 a sparkle, a cheekiness, a humor underneath the quiet weirdness. And I, I, I never quite understood it. There's something alien about Finnish people. Like you're, really? like you're, like you're from another planet, actually, because you're not the same as the Swedes or, I mean, the Russians have their things going on on the other side, but the Finns, you're quite particular, aren't you? We are. We are. Yes. Now now you, you took the genie out of the bottle. We are actually aliens. We were. Ah, I knew it. I knew it. That language as well. Beautiful language, but where the fuck did that come from? What a language! Did you know, did you know that uh, J.R. Tolkien was absolutely fascinated by uh, the Finnish language? And for example, what some of the Elven languages uh, sure. were inspired. Uh, Tolkien was hugely inspired by the Finnish language, and for even Elvish, I'm totally sure about that for sure. I, I, that does not surprise me in any way. It and is also a huge language. Uh, the the magician Gandalf uh, was very much inspired by Finnish mythology of Kalevala and their greatest hero Vainamoinen. Okay, and there is a magic quality to the Finnish. I don't quite understand what it is. There's a, a little bit of smile, fun, cheekiness, and a little bit of magic, and a lot of darkness too. Apparently, yeah. you have the most death metal bands per thousand po- people of the population. That's but, true. Uh, there's the darkness, and there's a few things going. On. I don't pretend to understand it but i i do like it okay so kitos let me say thank you appreciative uh, where do people find you online where do people go to check out your stuff here where's a, a good place to go well as i said uh just in maybe in a week i don't know when this uh will come time, online. a month at least at least a month yeah okay so very soon uh I will be uh, online on uh, my new web page called www. How many doubles you ask? The three W's. Uh, why not? Three. Three is good. Yeah. Uh, dot mindfulness. Dot com will be my website, and then uh, if you also you can find uh, my Instagram is mindfulness. I, I I haven't been very active there, but maybe I should start, and then. You should go to my YouTube channel, Mind Funfulness is the name of the YouTube channel. And then if you check in YouTube, for example, Petri Barnes on my name, you will find, I think there is now four before this, uh, like an hour long interviews about philosophy of breathing. Okay, well, there's definitely a few ways to check you out. I just added you on Instagram there, so we're. Uh, it looks like we're Instagram friends now. This has been yeah, really I'm, fun. I'm a bit wiped I'm out. So, so this, this is the book that I was talking What's about. It What's it called? Atmospheres of breathing. breathing. So this is the first, 2018 came from SUNY Press. It's the first anthology ever to be published on philosophy of breathing. And okay. then... If somebody wants to read my PhD, you can get it for free, the PDF version, if you type uh, Google phenomenology of breathing, uh, phenomeno- uh, sorry, phenomenological uh, ontology of breathing. It's the first thing that comes uh, and check it out. You are better at promoting yourself than most Finnish people, any Finnish person I've ever met, actually. Did you live in America or something? Like, how did you learn this, this skill? Well, actually, you are correct on this. When I was 10 years old, I lived for half a year. Then I have been living many places. I lived in Greece for five years. I lived in New Zealand. I lived in uh, Holland and, and so on. And then the thing is, like, I always thought that I'm not really Finnish. I, I happen to be born in a Finnish family and I talk a lot with my hands and I am allowed and so on. So I always connected somehow that I'm a strange Italian who just happened an, to be born. An Italian in a Finnish person's body. Oh my God, I don't know why I am, but uh, yeah, I like it. Okay, so I'll give you a shout if I'm in Helsinki. I do plan to visit on one day. I've never actually been to Helsinki. I've only been to the north of Finland. So I would like to visit one day. So if you're ever in London or Brighton, give me a shout. 
we'll give you an invite yeah. to the Ottoman Conference if you want to share your stuff there. Because I think it's very cool. It, I personally, I've enjoyed very much talking to a philosopher. It's not every day for me, and I did have a side interest in that back in the day. So it's um, it's nice to talk to a philosopher. Uh, do you have a closing message about the breath for all our listeners? Okay, the closing uh, message of the breath is what I already said, but I will tell my motto again. All things and phenomena of life need to be rethought, re-examined, and re-experienced within the experiential atmosphere of breathing. And then everything will change. It's going to be a certain kind of respiratory revolution. Boom, boom, boom. I like it. This has been a lot of fun. You've energized me. I'm going to take a quick break for my next interview. So, sir, keep us again. Thank you so much. Some ways to uh, get more, to give back, and to get more involved now. So um, the biggest request I have would be to share the podcast with your friends, people that you think would really enjoy it, um, email it to them, put it on your social media, tell them about it, old school. Um, yeah, really appreciate that. Equally, if you want to support us financially, you can go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash embodiment podcast, and give us a dollar an episode. And I'd say they're well worth a dollar. So um, that's less than a pound if you're in UK-ish. So yeah, please go there. Um, on the embodyfacilitator.com website is where this is hosted. If you're most people, I think, listen to for iTunes. Um, iTunes, we'd certainly appreciate a review. The way iTunes works means that a review means more people will find it. iTunes regards it as more important for searches. So even a couple of sentences review really does help as a little thank you to us. And if you want to go to embodyfacilitator.com, you can see the actual you know links to the sites. This comments on there um the facebook group tends to be where people discuss things so if you go to uh, put in the embodiment podcast into facebook there's a page which is relatively quiet and a group which does have some discussion on so um yeah i will reply to things personally there so um also on embodiedfacilitator.com website uh, there's all sorts of freebies there there's videos there's free ebooks there's ebooks you can buy and of course, is our newsletter list. If you want to stay in touch and learn about things like the Embody Facilitator course and our, um, you know, our next Embody Yoga Principles teacher training, then go to that website and you'll see a little pop up, and you can um, get the newsletter through there. Okay, so I think they're the main ones. Tell your friends, pay us some money on Patreon, give us a review on iTunes, uh, send us your email if you want to be on the newsletter list, and get involved on the Facebook. There, Whew, bit long. Uh, pick whatever you like that works for you. Until next time, welcome home to the body.